to develop some, some bridge um, between uh, empowerment and cultural diplomacy. So three questions uh, structured the, the paper. So what is empowerment? Yeah. So what is empowerment? What is the potential of empowerment uh, for addressing EU actual issues? So that's the second question. And the third question said is what are the challenges uh, about this kind of uh, new politics uh, on empowerment? So the first point is just a very simple question. What is empowerment? So we can define empowerment uh, very easily with four uh, points. First is a process of building and rebuilding <laughs> abilities and capacities of groups that are disadvantaged and vulnerable. Second point, um, it's a process including a kind of multi-dimensional approach, connecting political rights, active citizenship, information, care, as well as financial support, and of course, with uh, of course, a, a cultural dimension. So that's the second point. The third point, in order to define what is empowerment, very clearly, is that a process combining the role of individual responsibility um, and uh, active institutions, or even resilient. I will speak more about what is resilience. And the fourth uh, point is about the transformative dimension related to empowerment. I mean, when you speak about empowerment, you focus on democratic innovations, but uh, in practice. So you see the changing phases of politics, of relations of power. So of course, there are different kind of empowerment. There is the radical one. Uh, in history, it has been done by, uh, in the 60s by the um, uh, black civil rights activists, if you, if you remember, for example, the black power. And uh, the aim of this black empowerment was really to claim for a new balance of power and new balance of, of, of new rights. And it has a very strong political dimension. But after this radical empowerment, we can also include a liberal empowerment, focusing more on a uh, competitive free market, on efficiency, on, let's say, expert knowledge. And there is also a third kind of uh, empowerment, participative empowerment, focusing on deliberative publics, focusing on democratic legitimacy, and focusing more also on um, the, quality, the quality of parliamentary deliberation. So we have different forms of empowerment. There is no single way to practice and to develop uh, empowerment. Um, so now the second uh, question. So now we know a little bit more about what is empowerment, what are the different forms and conceptions of empowerment. And now the question is, what is the potential of empowerment for the EU actual issues? So that's a very uh, simple question. And for that, uh, I would um, single out different kind of empowerment. So I will start with social empowerment. Then I will develop a bit more about cultural empowerment. And then, if you have enough time, uh, develop a little bit about um, uh, economic uh, empowerment. And of course, when I will speak about cultural empowerment, um, I think you, you will have some uh, you will see some connections uh, between cultural empowerment and cultural diplomacy. I think so. And you, you will have also some um, discussions about uh, cultural empowerment, uh, cultural diplomacy, and maybe a notion, I think, um, which is more and more uh, used in politics, is the notion of resilience you know, about more political resilience. So what is the potential of the empowerment for actual issues? So first point about social empowerment. So what, what would be the utility of social empowerment now for 
EU uh, issue. So if you would like to uh, develop more um, empowerment in terms of uh, social uh, aspects, and then uh, the first focus would be on um, unions, and especially the, the role of unions inside the EU. Uh, the second focus would be on the role of associations, on civic organizations, and of course, uh, innovative NGOs. And then at the end, if you, if you are sensitive to, uh, to this kind of um, social empowerment, you would develop also um, the EU uh, as a, let's say, uh, a civic model, uh, as a welfare model with um, a lot of positive action for vulnerable groups. So that's one aspect of em empowerment. So I mean, it's much uh, more focused on social dimensions. Let's talk about a second kind, second form of uh, empowerment, which is more related to the conference, um, I guess, is cultural empowerment. So, what, what are the, the main um, char characteristics of cultural empowerment? So it's not only about uh, cultural or the role of the culture in the civilization. I think when you um, use cultural empowerment, um, you, you define culture uh, differently, so different points. So first, you really take care about the, the power of the culture. I mean, the, the political power of the culture. Second, you use um, culture as a critical tool. I mean, it's not just about art. Uh, when you would like to develop some kind of empowering politics, um, you use culture in order to uh, have a, a, a strong political voice. And the, the third dimension of cultural empowerment is that in, in that conception, um, culture is um, seen as a democratic language and practice. You know, it's not just about discourse. It's not just about theory. It's also about how we practice uh, culture. And if I have en enough time, let me just uh, discuss a bit more about the Belgian case, which is quite interesting. So why this Belgian case is interesting in order to uh, understand um, what is the promise of cultural empower empowerment? First, uh, it's because Belgium, as you know, there are different kinds of communities. There is a French-speaking community, and there is a Flemish community. But there is also a German-speaking community. Maybe you don't know that, but we also have that. And in Brussels, everything is even more complex. We have the two communities um, in, the, um, in the region, in the region of uh, Région de Bruxelles Capital. So uh, cultural empowerment has uh, a meaning here in Belgium. Why? It's just because um, with time, uh, we are used uh, to speak our own language. I mean, if you go to Anvers, if you go to Gand, to Ostend, if you go uh, uh, to Mechelen, um, you will listen uh, and you will learn to which extent the Flemish language is used uh, in the everyday life. And that's normal. But if you go to Liège, to Charleroi, uh, just here in the everyday life, if you go to a, a pub here in Brussels, um, we are mainly speaking uh, French. So the fact is that that's not only some sort of um, low politics. Um, it's very important. Why? Because we didn't have a government during more than one year. During more than one year, Belgium doesn't have didn't have any kind of federal government. And the cultural dimension was an issue. I mean, why it was an issue 
It was because um, some political players um, develop, developed a lot of um, um, strong political position uh, uh, culturally based. I mean, for example, a lot of stere stereotypes against Flemish, but also against French speaking. Uh, and a lot of um, uh, critique against political elites from the north and from the south. And even now, you know, this aspect uh, is still uh, on the agenda because the first minister, Elio Di Ruppo, um, is always criticized because um, of his inability to really share the Flemish culture and to really uh, practice uh, not only the Flemish culture, but the, the Flemish language. So uh, this is really important. And in fact, concretely, um, we can, we can uh, include a lot of different kind of, of initiatives to develop more inter intercultural dialogue uh, and to develop, let's say, a more uh, open identity of what is Belgium. So different kind of examples. Uh, first, very funny, in Belgium, quite recently, we have developed Erasmus exchange between Belgian universities. Very funny. Because I've been to Stockholm, okay? It was very easy to go to Stockholm. It was very nice, indeed. But now, um, some um, students are uh, more and more able to go to uh, Flemish universities, you know, to, to just learn what is the university uh, in Anvers, in Ghent, uh, in Leuven. And so it's also a very uh, active uh, citizenship in order to learn, in fact, a, a kind of a, a common language, you know? And so that's the first example. Second example, if you know a bit about uh, music, if you follow a bit rock, I don't know, Belgian rock, for example, Deus is a very famous uh, um, a singer and uh, a Flemish, uh, with Flemish roots, and he, he has developed a very important activism against uh, nationalism. And, uh, and he developed a lot, a lot of uh, different kind of discourses uh, in favor of uh, a more open community, a more uh, diverse and plural uh, Belgium. Third uh, example, quite recent. So it's more about participative and deliberative democracy, but I think um, there is something uh, in relation with uh, our point. So it was a, a participative device called G1000. And so we didn't have government, and so kind of ordinary citizens, uh, scientists, social scientists, but also some artists. And that's also interesting. They develop a kind of um, a democratic forum in order to um, discuss, about, discuss about employment policy, about cultural policy, about migrants policy. And it was a, a very interesting initiative because it was uh, also a, a common space with Flemish uh, speaking, with French speaking, with old people, with young people, with people from very different kind of background, kind of rich, kind of poor, and uh, migrants as well. And so it, it was a very interesting uh, initiative uh, in terms of cultural empowerment. So that was uh, an example. I think maybe uh, we can discuss more about that. So what about now the political empowerment, very concretely? Uh, what about the political empowerment? So here I will be a bit brief, and I would like to discuss a little bit uh, about one, at least to me, very um, original and innovative uh, EU institution. And um, it is the European Ombudsman. I don't know if you know who is the European Ombudsman. That's a real question. And just a name, that's Nikiforos Diamandouros. 
from two, 2002 and 2003. Um, in terms of political empowerment, uh, just very um, concretely, this kind of EU uh, institution, EU political uh, figure, is very important. Why? Uh, in terms of political empowerment. It's because, as a citizen, if you have um, a complaint about EU institutions, if you have a problem uh, with uh, EU public officials, or if you think that some of your rights uh, are not really um, um, or not uh, satisfied, um, you can call and you can write to this European uh, ombudsman. And so it's another way to, to think about um, European Union in practice. And what about kind of rights you have when you are um, uh, a citizen, a European uh, citizen. And that's also very interesting because then it could also create a kind of uh, uh, ethos of European public service. Because this is something very important, uh, at least to me, is that um, we, we must take care about what is the public service, what is the European public service, and uh, to which extent uh, citizens, European citizens feel that the European Parliament, the European Commission, that these institutions are their own institutions. Uh, and that's also uh, could create, um, let's say, empowerment or um, a more active uh, citizenship. So we have another point on an economic empowerment. Um, so maybe uh, I will discuss more of that uh, after, during the, the debate. And just conclude um, with a few words about the, the, the challenges, because of course, uh, nothing is easy. Uh, there are a lot of problems, a lot of uh, issues, and um, to develop empowerment is just uh, it's just not a, an idea. Uh, you need to face a lot of difficulties. So the first issue, to me, when you speak about empowerment and about cultural empowerment, especially, and maybe, but I would like to open the discussion with you, and maybe when you discuss and when you use cultural diplomacy as well, there is a danger of developing a kind of uh, <coughs> management gadget, you know, something which is very um, um, interesting, very easy, but not very deep, politically speaking. There is this risk. So I think that's one of the challenge, you know, to really use empowerment and cultural diplomacy as a democratic and as a transformative political tool and not as a kind of a, um, gadget or a very easy tool. So second kind of challenge um, about this uh, issue is that as cultural diplomacy, as far as I understood correctly, um, uh, cultural diplomacy and empowerment uh, is not just abstract theory, um, but it's um, a more, much more co complicated question about how we uh, balance and how we rebalance power of citizens and power of um, institutions. Uh, a third kind of challenge, you know, to really to renew a little bit the discussion about um, uh, empowerment, about new kind of uh, um, democratic politics, is maybe we, we could open the floor for a, a, a comparative discussion um, between empowerment, uh, resilience, and cultural diplomacy. Um, so I, I don't know if you know a little bit what is resilience. Yeah. Do you know a little bit about uh, that? In fact, it was first used in psychology when uh, uh, a people uh, faced a, a very important shock in his personal life. 
a very important uh, violence, then uh, some psychologists develop this kind of uh, resilience uh, in order to show that people have abilities to face uh, uh, violence and difficulties. So people have the power, in fact, to face huge problems in their personal life. So that was the original of the notion of resilience. In the French-speaking literature, one important name is Boris Cyrulnik. But this dimension is not very important. The important dimension is the political side. So now, and I have a colleague in, at King's College London, um, and he was, he was telling me that now resilience is more and more used um, in politics, in um, gender issues, uh, in um, terrorism and uh, against terrorism issues. And this is quite interesting because it focuses, maybe as cultural diplomacy, it, it focuses on the capacity of adaptation and of prevention uh, of organization and of institutions. And so one, for example, one real question is to which extent European institutions are resilient today, you know, facing the crisis, to which, to which, to which extent they are able to uh, face the huge crisis uh, actually. And maybe actually we can even um, discuss more the uh, resilience of the European Parliament. What about the power of the European Parliament today? And uh, the last point, the very last point, I'm don't know, I don't know about the, the time, but um, is maybe that we, we could um, uh, be sensitive on how to combine different kinds of actions. I mean, adding cultural interventions, cultural diplomacy or cultural empowerment with other forms and other types of action. And I've developed more uh, political actions or economic actions. So it's a, it's a call to, to have a, a real uh, comprehensive agenda, including seriously cultural empowerment and cultural diplomacy, and also to, uh, to enrich um, what is cultural diplomacy and cultural empowerment with other forms of intervention, uh, considering economy, but also politics, but also different kind of uh, fields. So I hope it was uh, helpful for you. And, um, and this is all. Thank you very much. Be pleased to take questions and comments. Who would like to go first? Don't be shy. Yeah, okay, turn it As you know, there are many occupied movements going on all around the, the world. And uh, London, New York, Detroit, Oakland, uh, mainly is practically there. Uh, a lot of these movements are articulating the same position that uh, the governments which uh, propose to represent them indeed and in fact don't. Uh, in, talking about empowering the citizen mm -hmm. politically. Uh, how do you reconcile those two different points of view? Well, not necessarily two different points of view, but that the, the dilemma of uh, trying to empower <coughs> people politically, and the argument that uh, that these governments, these democratic governments, are, uh, are in the hands of banks and, and uh, property rich people and don't really uh, represent the people and are, in fact, uh, dictatorships. So that, that's... That, 
that's a very in interesting question because um, it, it enables me to maybe to connect a little bit more um, the, the radical, the first form of empowerment, you know, the, the one that was developed by Martin Luther King in, in a way um, in the black civil rights movement. And to a certain extent, uh, the um, uh, movement des indignés now, you know, in the US, in the Europe, as it was called, um, could be, to a certain extent, um, uh, considered a, as quite close to a, a kind of a, um, radical form of call uh, for being really empowered. And it's really interesting because um, this movement, this, these actual social movements calling for uh, real empowerment, they, they are facing a lot of different kind of uh, challenges. And one of the, the challenges is about the organization. I mean, they are a bit, um, they are not really organized, they are uh, very plural, um, um, they do not develop a, a very clear call for uh, some reforms in terms of financial, in terms of a new kind of democracy. Um, but what is interesting in this social movement is that um, they push Europe, especially, um, to, to develop maybe new kind of political options. Uh, for example, in the past, if I remember correctly, um, anyone uh, pushing the tax Tobin was seen as a really like a communist. I mean, he was seen as a very radical. And now, I think the, the question of uh, taxing uh, speculation and transaction is becoming really mainstream politics. So uh, that's why we have maybe to wait a little bit and to see what would be the kind of impact of these social movements and to which extent they create um, a new kind of citizenship. Because mainly uh, the citizen active in this kind of uh, movements, and especially in Brussels, they are quite young. And they are not really, um, let's say, politicized at the, at the beginning. So they, they learn what is uh, political activism. They learn what is diplomacy. They learn uh, what is uh, finance, what is uh, um, the, the bank crisis as well. And so that could be interesting to see maybe in few in few years um, where this kind of activist will be. Uh, they will be maybe in civil society, maybe in political groups, uh, maybe they will uh, explore more some kind of NGOs, uh, maybe they will, we don't know, maybe they will create um, uh, a party. Uh, so it, it is quite interesting to, to see that the crisis has developed, has created uh, maybe uh, new forms of active um, citizenship and new kind of critique of what is the European Union. but you said cultural empowerment and using cultural empowerment and cultural diplomacy together with other, um, yeah, it's to enrich concepts with other forms then. What is the difference or similarity then, I guess, with um, Joseph Nye's concept of smart power? Thank you. In, in fact, I think w when you um, think about the, the root of empowerment, so the you need to go to the United States and you need to, you need to, um, to explore uh, a kind of radical empowerment. So it was really, uh, I, I just, w once again, it was really about how we um, organized, how we rebalance what is the power in the United States. Um, so th th there is a really radical um, a dimension. Um, I mean, if you look at the historical roots of empowerment, 
uh, it's this kind of um, uh, dimension. But now what is becoming more and more uh, complex is that empowerment, I don't know if you are quite interested by um, uh, development politics and what uh, is doing the World Bank, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to do some kind of uh, empirical work, is that empowerment is, uh, is, is also used by the World Bank experts, but to, to another sense. And so what is interesting is that empowerment now is used in a much more um, uh, managerial uh, way. Uh, empowerment is used to develop, let's say, economic um, agents, economic powers, uh, focusing on uh, women, peasants, and uh, uh, other kind of vulnerable uh, groups. So the, the roots of empowerment, I think, and the, um, and the different kind of aspects of empowerment are really uh, specific. And about cultural uh, diplomacy, I, I think that the cultural diplomacy, but I'm not a specialist, uh, uh, doesn't share the, the same kind of uh, radical uh, or uh, changing view uh, as it was uh, developed by the um, uh, civil, uh, civil society in the United States. It, is, it has another kind of um, uh, influence. It has other kind of roots, other kind of uh, um, important uh, notions. Um, I think that the, the notion of smart power um, c could be could be also discussed and maybe rediscussed, and uh, that's also the the promise of uh, um, both empowerment and cultural diplomacy is that you, you are able maybe to revisit, let's say, uh, the classical concept of political science or of political sociology, and not only to revisit you know, intellectually speaking, but also to, to practice them. Because that is what said, for example, yesterday, if I remember correctly, um, when, when, when we spoke about uh, the Jordanian case, um, it was very interesting to know um, the, the practical aspects of uh, the cultural dialogue and the cultural diplomacy. So I think there is a call here to also to really discuss and debate seriously um, the, the, the political notions, but also maybe to, to be more in innovative when you have to practice and when you have to organize this notion into everyday uh, politics. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask everyone to please uh, join me in expressing our gratitude to Fabrizio Cantelli. Thank you very much.